Uh, the floor is yours, so feel free to uh, kick it off whenever you're ready. Sure. Hi, so thank you all for coming. This is our first webinar Wednesday um, at CSMP. I'm Emily Stam. I'm the Vice President and COO at CSMP. I'm also a security research engineer at Allstate specializing in cryptography. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start it off with just giving an introduction to CSMP and what we do. Um, and then Abdel Saifain, president of CSMP, will follow me and talk about finding leaked GitHub credentials and give a demonstration. And then Dave Linder, director of application security at Contrast, um, will follow that and talk about protecting runtime applications. So once again, thank you all for being here and thank you to our sponsor, Contrast Security. So CSNP, um, Cybersecurity Nonprofit, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that provides free and accessible security education. We started off as a meetup group in Chicago, as Chicago Cybersecurity, and we held regular events um, on security. And we had a lot of traction, um, a lot of interest in the community in these events. So last May, we decided to become an official nonprofit. And since then, um, Chicago cybersecurity has become the Chicago chapter and we've branched out to 14 other cities across the US and recently one in India as well. So our slogan is learn, innovate and secure. Um, so in addition to having events, we now have other programs as well, um, falling under the categories of learn, innovate and secure. So when we think of learn, that's like providing um, educational content, uh, webinars, workshops, hackathons, um, things like that to build security skills. Um, and that includes practical cyber safety skills, as well as more technical skills that you would need to get a career in security. Then we have Innovate, and this is our most recent department. It's the Research and Development Department, which I'll talk about later. And it just encourages innovation in security and technology. And finally, Secure. Um, so we address the growing demand of security professionals by providing opportunities for networking and career development, um, as well as just information and guidance about cybersecurity professions. So our goal is to build a more inclusive and diverse um, um, community and education for cybersecurity. And I think that our CSNP board advisor, Paul Lanzi, said it well um, when he said, we face two intertwined parallel crises in information security today. Too many open jobs with not enough qualified talent to fill them and a general lack of proficiency on privacy and information security among the public. Through the work of CSNP, I hope that we can address the diversity gap in the information security practitioner population and raise the general level of awareness on privacy and information security topics. So to give a little more information about the types of programs we have, um, we have events. So we have um, hackathons, um, hackathons where you can go and actually try to find and exploit vulnerabilities um, and win prizes. Then we have presentations um, where you learn from security professionals and you can earn CPE credits. Our new research and development pro um, program, which I'll talk a little bit more about soon. Workshops um, where you can collaborate and learn new technical skills and panel discussions. And we also have a new community outreach department as well. Um, so if you're interested in finding out about our events, um, all of our events um, that we have are listed on this page. Um, so this includes in-person and virtual events. And if you're interested in just events um, in a certain city, you can go to our chapters page and find um, a city near you and look at their events. Um, so for example, if you live in Chicago, as I do, um, you can go to our Chicago page, stay connected with our LinkedIn group, Meetup um, as well, and see events that are happening just in Chicago. Uh, 
Okay, so then I wanted to talk about our new innovation project. So our research and development team um, is supporting initiatives by members, volunteers, and contributors um, to develop and improve new services and products. So our first um, program that we're doing is a focus on open source software, and it's currently hosted on GitHub. So we're encouraging um, people to open source um, projects that they're working on on our CSNP GitHub. And we're also offering support, guidance, and resources such as AWS services um, as well to our contributors so that they can um, help and innovate in that way. And we're also encouraging people to connect on our Slack and talk about these programs and really just collaborate more in that sense. Um, so please feel free to check out this page. And um, also, if you have ideas about this as well, you can um, submit this form and tell us your thoughts. And if you want to see more information specifically about the open source project, you can find that here. Um, we're looking for managers, contributors, maintainers, um, really just a diverse set of backgrounds to help contribute on this project. And you can submit a project proposal here as well. And I wanted to talk about our outreach program. Um, so our community outreach team also started in Chicago. Um, so our goal is to provide resources, events, and trainings um, at schools, universities, and libraries and reach a different audience. So for instance, in Chicago, most of our events are held in the downtown area and attended by technical professionals, but we wanted to reach um, areas in the greater Chicago um, area. And we also wanted to just um, help with cyber safety education in general. Um, so that's one of our initiatives is that we want to help people to protect themselves um, from cyber and privacy threats such as ransomware, phishing attacks, social engineering and scams. Um, so kind of go beyond um, if you want to be in a security field, you know, everyone needs to know how to protect themselves, whether or not they want to do it as a career. Um, but we also want to talk about the careers that are in security and help people who want to get into careers. And finally, we want to help secure organizations as well. And we are definitely looking for volunteers. Um, so you can apply or reach out to us if you're interested. Um, we have a lot of departments. We have marketing, uh, the research and development, community outreach, our chapters, and leadership as well. And you can also check out our blog where we'll have um, a lot of different posts from cyber safety to more technical um, security posts as well. Yeah, so I think that's all. And Abdel, you can take it away. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> don't, if you're interested in becoming a CSNP member, um, yep. Go ahead and click on join, uh, fill out the form at the bottom, and, and that's it. We'll get in touch with you. So again, if you're interested in uh, joining, becoming an official member, please go ahead and uh, fill out this form. Excellent. Thank you, Emily. I will go ahead and share my screen now. Uh, let's see. Emily, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, everyone. Um, my name is Abdel Fang. I am the uh, president of CSNP. I'm also a senior manager at Protivity. So today I'm going to talk about detecting and preventing um, sensitive data leakage. Till this day, somehow, <laughs> Um, we've all heard about like the Uber stories, how Uber was breached back in 2016. Till this day, somehow organizations are, and these are mature organizations, are having developers who are accidentally or intentionally putting their um, access keys out there on GitHub. And you're wondering why is that happening? 
I'm just going to go over a few scenarios here where this happened and it had a large impact on whether it was on the individual or or on an or at the uh, uh, on an organization. Research of uh, sorry, research, researchers at North Carolina State University actually scanned 13% of public GitHub that are out there, uh, repositories that are out there, and what they found was that over 100,000 of those repositories had some sort of sensitive data, some sort of secret or access key. And you're probably wondering, you know, why is that happening? Well, these are individuals um, like yourself, like myself, who are who have a public GitHub repo and we're doing some amazing things out there. But unfortunately, we're failing to realize that we shouldn't expose our um, public keys, um, public keys, API keys, passwords on GitHub because we may be doing it to, you know, for convenience to make things easier for ourselves. But we have to keep in mind that attackers also have access to those public repositories. Um, 2016, Uber disclosed that they they had a breach. 57 million users were affected by this breach, and this breach was cause because a developer had the Uber AWS access key committed to GitHub. And this attacker was able to look at their public GitHub, get that access key and actually access um, their AWS account. And another story, uh, there was a mystery Git ransomware that started creating blank commits and, and demanded uh, Bitcoin in order to um, basically decrypt your code in order to allow you to gain access back to your Git repository. Now, you're probably wondering, how did this happen? Well, both GitHub and GitLab actually did research to try and determine why their users' um, uh, accounts, Git accounts were getting encrypted. And what they found was that these developers were actually, at one point in time, they committed their own access token in GitHub somewhere. So they took their own GitHub access token and posted on GitHub somewhere. And these developers were able to gain access to their own personal token and actually encrypt their uh, repositories with it. And last but not least, the uh, Scotia Bank um, exposed some source code, some intellectual property, as well as access keys, credentials. It was very bad. And this is, again, they posted this on um, public GitHub. So this kind of leads back into why are we leaking credentials? Why is this still happening today? I myself have worked for large organizations in the past and we've had scenarios where this happened. We've had scenarios where developers leak credentials, but we, it, it seems like the developer, when they left the organization, they thought they were entitled to the code, so they took it with them and they committed to GitHub. And unfortunately, there were improper measures to ensure that these developers weren't committing code into GitHub. So unfortunately, um, this happens to a lot of people. It happens to large organizations because training developers to understand why this is bad seems to be hard when you're in enterprise. And there aren't a lot of solutions, at least not until now, there weren't a lot of solutions that would actually help prevent this. So what do you do? Well, first thing first is technology, right? There are a couple of things you can put in place to prevent your developers from doing such thing. Um, the first, the easiest thing that any developer can do is use environment variables. It has no cost. Um, you don't have to do anything special. Just use environment variables and not commit those access keys, passwords, API keys to GitHub. Number two, get some sort of credential manager. Um, HashiCorp Vault is actually a, a popular one. Um, it's not too complicated to set up. You set it up, you keep your keys in there, and it manages for you. Number three, I've seen some organizations do this where they determine that they can't stop the developers from pushing code into, um, sorry, pushing sensitive key to GitHub. So what they do is they encrypt everything. They encrypt their entire Git repositories. The only problem with that is you still have to manage those keys, right? Those keys still need to be stored somewhere. Someone needs to access them. Next, you can actually scan your commit history. There are 
couple of tools out there and I would actually demo one of them um, at the end of this presentation that can actually scan your entire commit, Git commit history and actually find sensitive keys, uh, sensitive data within your commit history. And last but not least, you can actually reject Git push. Um, there's a popular open source tool out there called Sedated. Sedated actually prevents developers from ever pushing sensitive key onto GitHub. Um, I'll go into more details on how it does exactly. And after technology, technology is great. You can have all of these things in place, but unfortunately it's still technology. It can still be circumvented in certain ways. And really until you can train your developers not to do certain things until you have some sort of a educational process where you're training them, this is, this is gonna to continue to be a problem that we wanna see go on. Okay. Next slide. So some of these solutions are Git secret. Um, I mentioned this earlier, Git secret allows you to actually encrypt your files so that you can store passwords in them, but they're encrypted. This way, no one else can see it. But again, the issue is you still need to manage those keys. Now, Sedata is the um, open source tools that actually prevent your developer from ever uh, pushing anything sensitive onto GitHub. Uh, what it does is it has a pre-received Git hook. And really, in a nutshell, what happened is when developer pushed their code into um, GitHub, Sedata steps in, scan the entire code to make sure that it doesn't violate um, some predefined regex rules, whatever makes sense to your organization. So if you know you're pretty heavy on AWS and AWS has a specific key length and you can create regexes that would capture those sort of things. So Sedata would actually stop your developer from pushing anything sensitive to GitHub. Um, in fact, until they either get a request to whitelist their commit or they remove the, um, the uh, sensitive data, it will not allow them to push, the, uh, to push their code onto GitHub. So Trufflehug is it's, uh, becoming a popular tool. What Trufflehug does is it, can, it has the ability to scan your entire Git commit history. Um, and I'm gonna show you a, a demo here what that looks like. Um, I'm gonna close this out. So I have a Git repository and I have already installed Trufflehawk. It's very easy, simple to set up. Um, if you're already using Python, it's pip install Trufflehawk and you're, ready, you're good to go. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do here is type Trufflehawk. I wanna make sure that entropy is off because that's gonna give me a lot of noises. And I want to use the default truffle hog regex. And then I will paste in my GitHub, um, my GitHub URL. And as you can see, I don't have a lot of commits here, 17 commits. Um, I purposely went in there, added some secrets, but as you can see, truffle hog went through all this commit history and actually found secrets, found um, some sort of like violation. And Trufflehug does give you some information about the commit itself, um, such as the date, the uh, commit hash, which is probably, I would say, the most important thing that you need. Because suppose that you want to validate this data, right? What you would want to do is go to GitHub and actually do a search for that specific commit. Now that should come up and you'll see the actual commit where I committed all of this sensitive data. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's how Trufflehog works. It looks like your commit history, it goes through it and it tells you what's been violated. So as a developer, you might wonder, okay, this is great. Um, Trufflehog found something from 10 years ago. How do I remove it? There actually are a couple of solutions out there. Um, one of the popular one is BFG Repo Cleaner. BFG Repo Cleaner actually allow you to go back to uh, an earlier commit and actually remove that. Well. I say remove quote unquote, it doesn't actually remove something, rather it replaces it. So suppose I wanted to uh, remove this password, what BFG would do is come back to this commit and actually replace this value here with some other garbage text. Um, and essentially that's how it works. 
Okay, um, that's really what I wanted to uh, talk through today's presentation. I'm going to leave the floor open for questions, if anyone has questions. And I know I do see a question here, I just need to be able to pull that up. Uh, are there any questions out there? Uh, I, you should be able to type in the uh, Q&A if you have any. If not, we can move on to uh, Dave. I have a question. Oh, go for it. Um, is there any flexibility which, in terms of which types of credentials or how, um, I guess, what gets looked for, especially if you're doing something that might you might need to use you know, dummy credentials, for example, mm -hmm. um, just while you're testing something? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, unfortunately, no, right? Because it's, this is technology. It's, it's not like some super advanced AI. It's now going to know what's real data and what isn't. And the truth is, I mean, to you, that might be a test, you know, a dummy password. But honestly, someone out there is using password is equal to password. You know, so unfortunately, you want to make sure you capture those because you just um, you just can't trust your developer. You just can't trust your users. So you capture that. You prevent your developers from pushing those things out there, and you have them reach out to you and say, "Hey, this is not real." Um, that way, that you know, the security engineer is actually validating that it's not real. Okay, so it looks like we have a couple of questions here. So someone said, what is open source? Um, in simplest term, it just means free code. Um, it's free application. You can take it, use it, and you can modify it, make changes to it as you like. Um, when you're dealing with open source, though, make sure you take a look at the licenses if you in any way are considering um, modifying the original code and I don't know, maybe reselling it or something. Um, just make sure to pay attention to those licenses. Okay, um, do you know if BFG and Trufflehog work on other Git frameworks like Bitbucket? I actually don't know that. I know that Sedated does work on other Git, um, but Trufflehog, Trufflehog, I think, um, I know when I used it, I remember, I had to install Git Python, which makes me think that um, it, it might be specific. I'm not sure if it, if it works for Git Bucket. I have not tried that. Uh, someone says, sorry, I mean, which one of the tools you mentioned is open source? Oh, yeah, they're all open source. Every tool that I mentioned were all open source. I am a uh, big fan of open source. Okay, um, if there are any questions, oh, it looks like one came in. Do you think the OOPS top is useful resource to train developers on implication of security? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, those are the common, in my experience, we, you know, in my experience, I don't remember the statistic, but there are still things like um, SQL injection, um, uh, cross-site scripting that are still, somehow developers, they're not getting the proper training to actually uh, mitigate those kind of um, security flaws in the environment. Um, I think OOPS is definitely helpful. Uh, but to this presentation, you know, I want to say let's train the developers and tell them like, hey, you should not have passwords, API keys, anything that anyone can use to access anything within the environment on GitHub. Just don't do it. So someone is asking the four listed apps were Git Secrets, Trufflehog, BFG Repo Cleaner, and Sedate it. Um, yeah, I can, I can, I'll drop that in the chat later. Okay, um, I think it's safe to, oh, wow, someone, uh, <laughs> someone joined in late here. So we're still doing good on time. We have two more minutes, so I can go ahead and answer these here. Sorry, just joining late. 
I'm a network and server admin for CDO Chicago, interested in learning more about hands-on tech. Oh, okay. Uh, Emily, this might be more towards you, maybe. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, pass it off to Dave. Dave, give me one moment while I make you a co-host here. I'm sorry, David. Okay, David, you should be able to talk now. Let's see, I'm gonna promote you to panelists. Can you hear me, David? Yes. Uh, excellent, yes. excellent, excellent. Okay, um, so Dave is the uh, director of um, uh, director of application security at Contrast, and today he's going to talk about WAF and RASP. And without further ado, um, take it away, David. Hey, thanks, Abdel, and thanks, Emily, for uh, for having me again. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, it's nice and sunny here in little old Iowa. Hopefully uh, everyone's enjoying the, the weather around them. <laughs> it's actually uh, cloudy and rainy here. <laughs> well, we just got the sun, to be fair. It's been cloudy and rainy most of the day. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, I wanted to talk about uh, extending right, uh, talk about WAF and RASP. Um, so let's let's dig right in. So Abdel mentioned I'm David Minder. I'm the director of AFSEC at Contrast Security at Golf Hacker Dave on Twitter. Feel free to reach out. DMs are open. Um, always open for good discussions on AFSEC. But uh, you know, not so breaking news. Software applications are vulnerable and they're being attacked. I think everyone is pretty well aware of that. This hasn't changed over the years, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. You know, we, we hear of, uh, you know, some breach here and there every other week, it seems like at this point. And, you know, even now more front and center with, um, you know, some of the, you know, the Zoom headlines and things like that that are going on. You know, but uh, we, we, uh, we pull in data from some of our tooling uh, and, and it kind of just shows a, a broad picture of, you know, the sorts of attacks that we're seeing, how frequently they're happening. Uh, what types of attacks, you know, from injection to path traversal, cross-site scripting, things like that. So, you know, applications are definitely under attack. You know, the, the, the interesting thing is, is we just released a state of software <clears throat> report for January and February. And, and my CTO, he's like, you know, the one stat that we don't show, there's not a single app on here that hasn't been attacked. Um, and that's true. Um, all apps at some point are under attack. It is very rare, would be extremely rare if, if they weren't under attack at some point. There's just so much drive-by scripting and you know, drive-by uh, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, you name it, types of attacks um, all across the internet. And you know, one thing that we've noticed over the years is you know, we've done all sorts of standards, models, movements, you know, all sorts of, you know, OWASP top tens, you know, we added static analysis, dynamic analysis, different sorts of scannings, the BSIM, OpenSAM across the years. And if you look at the numbers and you dig into the vulnerabilities and applications, the numbers really haven't changed much. And if you might look at that and like, oh, well, have we done anything? Yes, we've done a lot. Uh, it's just the numbers are staying similarly the same. You know, the technology stacks get bigger, they get more complex. We solve some issues, new issues come on board. You know, it's, it's one of those things that we're ever changing. And one thing you'll see on here is the shift left movement, which 2017-ish, you know, maybe a little bit before that, uh, where we're talking, you know, move security is far left in the cycle as possible. You know, even when you're talking about, you know, what are the requirements for this project or this new feature? Move it all the way there and start through all the way up through development and so on and so forth. Um, but I want to talk about extending right. We don't talk a whole lot about going that way. Um, so let's talk about, you know, what problem we're facing, you know, back in the day when we're like, oh, shoot, applications are under attack. You know, every report you read, like the number one breach uh, you know, number one way that applications or organizations get breached are through applications. 
so back in the day, you know, early 2000s, we're like, well, we know firewalls. We know networking really well. Firewalls block things. You know, they do a lot of, a lot of good for us. Um, so what we did is we put that, you know, two and two together and said, hey, let's, let's try to create some firewall that can help block application traffic, if you will. Uh, so that's what we did. We, we tried to create a firewall. We call it an, a web app firewall or web application firewall. Um, 2002 or 2003, I think is about when, when those were created, uh, back in the mod security real early days. Right. Um, you know, we just, we really just tried to create a firewall to solve the problem that, Hey, in all of our network based firewalls, we just had to open these, you know, port 80 and port 443 and just let everything through. And now our network based firewalls weren't doing their jobs anymore. Right. So we, we created this, this web app firewall thing. And we quickly learned that it was a really difficult thing to maintain. Uh, it's at the layer seven. So those of you that don't understand the, the different layers, layer seven is the application layer where it's scanning and looking at what the traffic coming in. So from your browser, so you make a request from the browser to the backend application, it's looking at that request. It's looking at the data in that request. And basically what it's doing is it's, it's, it's looking at the request and it's running a bunch of regular expressions, uh, looking for different, um, uh, potential attacks and things like that. So you can imagine there's a lot of alerting and a lot of things going on there. There's a lot of tuning that has to happen, you know, where I've got to make some changes or some new attack or exploit comes out and I got to make sure that I'm protected there. So, so at a high level, what does that look like? So let's just say that you're, you're browsing to a web application and you have an input field. And so my input field is a name field here. So I type contrast space or one equals one dash dash. So what this basically is, is it's, it's a SQL injection attack. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to inject SQL into the backend, hoping that way it will run against the database. So what a WAF will do is it will run some regular expressions or some signature checks against my input. So it'll see that and be like, oh, I know or one equals one. That's a common thing that you know, attackers or someone will try to inject into the backend. So we'll block it. It'll say, hey, that matches the signature. I'm going to block it. Great, that's, that's what it's meant for. So, but at the same token, it's gonna do the same thing here. So what I have instead of the contrast or one equals one is I have semicolon cat Etsy password. So what I'm trying to exploit here is I'm trying to get this uh, to run on the backend OS and maybe return the contents of the password file on a Unix based system. But, Neither of these, you know, maybe one would work, maybe one wouldn't work, maybe both wouldn't work, but a WAF doesn't have any context, right? So if I run this, if I run contrast or one equals one, but on the back end, it's not actually doing any SQL, I didn't really need to block it. Like it, it's not going to succeed, but a WAF is going to do that because it's all based on signatures. Same thing here. I don't know that this is going to run in a context in the back end that's going to run that on the OS. Uh, but the WAF doesn't know that. It says, oh, Etsy password, that's bad. I'm going to block it. So I have this really strange analogy, but it works for me. So think about you go into this new fancy zoo. Uh, it's got a great new monkey cage, and it's got these, these fences set up. And you can throw anything at the fence you want. But that fence is only going to allow bananas. Like everything else, it's just going to block, right? Uh, it, it won't let it in. And it's based on what it looks like, probably the, the size, you know, all sorts of different things. But what if, what if, you know, the monkey wants something else, right? So the way that the WAF is doing this is it's blocking on certain things and allowing certain things based on some rules, right? So if you look at some of these, it may look like garbly gook to a lot of people, I look at these regular expressions and things like this every single day. And you can imagine how quickly we can get in trouble with these sorts of rules by creating false positives where it will block things that's legitimate or having false negatives where like if you look at the third one in, in my list here, these on events. So there are tons and tons of on events like on click, on error, on mouse click, you know, all sorts of on events. There's actually the last time we checked, there are 374 and they change frequently. 
So the on events are used quite a bit to maliciously inject JavaScript or cross-site scripting into an application. So you got to continually keep on top of all those on events. And browsers have some hidden ones too. So Firefox may have a few, Chrome may have a few. Uh, so you just got to keep on top of that and continually update things. So I go out, I make my updates, right? So the monkey wants more than just bananas. The monkey wants some apples and some oranges too. So I've now tuned it. It's going to allow a few more things, maybe block some other things that we we're having problems with. But then, you know, I've got to make even more changes because, you know, the tuning of the initial rules happens over and over and over, and it starts to get really, really complex. So this is one rule, one rule tuned uh, with some mod security um, for with a sec rule, right? It's just a command injection rule that I've tuned now for a specific attack type. Um, and you can see how complex and, and arduous this may get. And even with this, I'm gonna have false positives. I'm gonna have false negatives, right? So I'm gonna allow things like this. So I have a banana, I have my orange, and now I have a rotten apple, but to the fence, it still kind of looks like an apple, so it's gonna let it through, and now my monkey's getting sick, right? So my application is now getting attacked because I haven't tuned it enough to detect that that rotten apple versus you know the the, the good looking apple. So you know from a WAF perspective, uh, you know it works great, but it also has a lot of issues too, right? There's there's alert fatigue. Uh, you can imagine how many alerts that these are getting, especially with the legitimate drive by scanning or even legitimate traffic. You know I, I've seen some applications do some crazy stuff with crazy amounts of different data with all sorts of characters that could set off a WAF like crazy, uh, which is going to require tuning. Uh, there's patching fatigue, right? So on the on the right here on the screen, I've got a list. Uh, I had a, a customer come to me and say, hey, how do you cover all of these things? I'm like, well, what is this? They're like, oh, these are all the patches we've applied to our WAF. I'm like, holy moly, they've had to apply a patch to their WAF for like almost every C CVE, common vulnerability, that their applications could potentially be vulnerable to. So anytime a CVE comes out, there's a new patch for it for their WAF, they have to apply it. That's, that's what I call patch, patching fatigue. It's like, uh, you know, Windows Patch Tuesday or whatever, right? Uh, it's over and over and over again. Plus it stops real traffic, right? Uh, it's not a perfect process. Uh, they're reg regular expressions for the most part. They're looking for specific signatures and we can't control what developers are doing. You know, uh, we, we don't know if developers are gonna be doing something that's legitimate that looks like an attack, um, but that does happen. And there, there are bypasses. Um, again, on the other end, there's false negatives, right? Bypasses. So some interesting ones here, Command injections are really, really hard one, right? Uh, so I'm trying to get something to run on the operating system or on the back end for me to get some data. You know, some that I've seen here where they're trying to grab a, a, a variable, an environment variable, uh, and funny doesn't exist, so it just puts nothing there, which brings ETC together as Etsy, right? Same thing with the, the WAF variable on the right side. That's a common bypass. Or you can use the, the question mark to have the, the backend system kind of expand that. And, and so you see that gobbledygook on the right or on the left and on the right, it's really bin cat Etsy password, which is you know trying to, to view the contents of Etsy password. Same thing with SQL injection. There's been a lot of bypasses. Um, for the most part, requires spaces when you're trying to inject SQL code, but uh, some SQL parsers allow a comment block or treat a comment block, the slash star star slash, as a space. So that's a common bypass technique. So you can imagine, you know, you have multiple people that are trying to manage the WAFs and, and tweak them and tune them and, you know, have people complaining that legitimate traffic's blocked or I have this new CVE for this stretch, stretch vulnerability that I now have to patch. So, you know, WAFs have issues, but everything has issues. So in comes, RASP, Runtime Application Self-Protection. So a RASP is similar to a WAF, but in many cases, it's completely different. Um, so how is it similar? It's layer seven, right? So it's, it's in the application. It's used to stop real attacks at that layer. Um, but tuning is very low. 
uh, with, with a good REST product and alerts are very low. So it's looking and, and it's very accurate versus the alert fatigue that you may get with your, your typical WAF. Um, the, the key pieces to a RASP is it can see into the application. It's running in the application. It's got vision into the in, intelligence in the application that a WAF would not. A WAF is usually running on the outside of some network somewhere or in your cloud. You know, you have AWS WAF or Azure WAF turned on. It's running way outside of the application and has no context. You know, how I kind of talked before about the different attack types, and I'll get into that in a minute here with a, a RASP. Um, but you know, security can also be enabled anywhere that your code is running. So it's not, you know, you you can move your code from you know AWS to Azure. Just move it to that system, and as long as you take your ass with your code, it's good to go. Whereas with the WAF, the the AWS WAF probably doesn't run in Azure and vice versa, right? So it gets it gets to be portable, if you will. So how is it different, right? So a RASP. This is the same sort of attack we talked about before with a WAF where I'm gonna pass contrast or one equals one, dash, dash. So with a RASP, it's gonna follow that input all the way through the application. It's gonna see it come in and it's gonna see where it tries to go out. So we call that a source where it comes in and a sync where it goes out. So if I am at the sync and that's a sync that's calling a SQL execute or something similar and trying to run SQL code, a RASP says, oh wait, hold on. I'm gonna block this because it's actually going to execute in the SQL context that I'm not expecting to get, you know, user input or uh, untrusted data into, right? But if I move on to the next attack example and the same thing, since I've already established that it's trying to run SQL code against the database, the RAF says, oh, well, this kind of looks like command injection. So I'll probably alert you on that. You know, and this is kind of a probe, but you don't have to do anything. It's not actually going to execute. It's not ending up in a, a sync that's going to run the code that you're trying to inject into the system. But you might want to pay attention to it. You know, it's, it's not going to necessarily alert, alert, alert you if you don't want it to, uh, but you also don't have to do anything about it. There's, there's no real action, right? Versus here, you might want to one, figure out if it's something you need to fix, right? Or two, make sure that it's been prioritized appropriately to get it fixed, right? Because you know for sure this is actually executing, it's unvalidated input. And if I didn't have my RASP running, it wouldn't be stopped. So, you know, deeper dive into this, right? So I talked about sources and sinks. So basically what's happening here is it's, it's, it's taking that input, just like a, a WAF would, right? And it's taking it based on a source. So it's gonna look at everything really in the HTTP request. It's gonna look at headers, cookies, URI query strings. It's gonna look at post parameters, you name it, everything that's part of that request. Uh, and it's going to make sure that, you know, if we hit a source that's appropriate for a specific rule, right? So, you know, there are certain sources, let's just say like XSS, can you, perform a cross-site scripting attack with a um, cookie? And the short answer is yes, but not really. You can, for the most part, perform a couple of different things. You can perform a self XSS, right? Because you have to actually change it or potential uh, stored XSS. So it gets really complex. And you can imagine the amount of complexity in code that has to go into thinking about all of the different ways that someone could perform a different attack and what's really a source and what, what matters along those lines, right? And then we look for the sinks. You know, I mentioned the sinks before, where that is going out. So what it comes down to and what it actually looks like is I see this untrusted user input come in in the source. I see that my sync, my defined sync of execute query is called, right? And I now analyze the whole string. I'm like, oh shoot, this token boundary is crossed from the OR one equals one here. This shouldn't exist. Someone's trying something funky here. I better send an alert somewhere and, and get someone to look at it. So it's almost like you know, this real time thing living in your code and you know it's real and it's, it's ending up in a place that could be bad if you didn't have it running. It's kind of like your car, you're driving down the road and you get that annoying tire pressure monitor thing 
But guess what? It's not annoying because it's probably actually telling you, hey, you need to pull over and fill up with you know, some air. Um, so it's much more simple, clean look than your WAF, right? This is an example of like a dashboard of the rules for a RASP. I've turned on command injection. I've turned on cross-site request forgery. I've turned on cross-site scripting. You know, there's no patching. I don't patch because of CVEs or anything like that. But it also has its downfalls. You know, it is extremely language and framework specific. And I want to, you know, reiterate that point. It has to be, you know, you think about how many different um, languages there are and, and versions of languages and point versions and frameworks and, and versions of frameworks, it starts to get really crazy and complex. Um, the install is sometimes more difficult because it has to be done on the server with the application. And you know, sometimes your AppSec teams or, so, or, or your SOC teams, whoever would be managing the RASP, don't have the insight in how to do that. Oftentimes also, you don't see anything. Uh, since the RASP is very accurate and it doesn't tend to, to block or stop or uh, notify you when you know, nothing's actually happening, you may not see much. Uh, we have customers who are like, hey, you know, we, don't, we don't see much here. Uh, and then you know, every once in a while they get one or two. I'm like, well, you know, things are pretty good then. Uh, that means that you're not really under attack that often. Um, and there's also some performance concerns. Uh, you know, it's running in the app, it's instrumenting your code, it, it, it adds overhead, you know, like 10-ish percent in some cases, depending on the code. Uh, you know, the great thing about RASP is it's, it's, it's a standard. Uh, it's already in uh, the NIST 853 for those of you in the government space and, you know, some of the financial sector uses it as well. Um, so it's something that is being, uh, know, thrown into uh, the, the bucket of things that we should do to that extend right. So I'm now in the application, I know what's going on, and you know, I can protect myself from the known 26.7 vulnerabilities that I may not have fixed yet or even found. So, you know, what I really want to get to is, I think the WAF and the RASP should work in harmony. I think they should work together. I think their strengths and weaknesses complement each other, right? So you look at the WAF, it has alert fatigue, false positives, false negatives are pretty high. A RASP, it's very accurate, and oftentimes there's no results. So that they're right there, they're, they're complementing each other, right? Um, so it's not like you, you put them together and all of a sudden you get double the alerts and, and double all this, right? Because the WAF is gonna block what it can, and then the things that get through, which we know it's, it's prone to, will be blocked hopefully by your RASP, right? WAF, you have patching and tuning that's required, or as a RASP, you have very little tuning and some gap coverage. So we'll talk about gap coverage in a, in a second here. Uh, a WAF, you don't have any actionable results, right? You see all these blocked events, but you don't really know if they would have succeeded. You're not sure if I need to make a change to my code or talk to my developers that, hey, we've got SQL injection here, we need to do something about it. Where as a RASP, it can point exactly in the code where the problem is, uh, especially in cases where, say, you're running on WebSphere or WebLogic or some backend uh, application server. It's instrumenting that code too, and we found vulnerabilities with RASPs uh, in those platforms and helped them patch things, even though you know it was one of their customers that was using their product. Um, but then you look at the RASP weaknesses. There's performance impacts. Uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you they're not. Uh, whereas a WAF, it's fairly performant. It's 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 really good. It's sitting sitting on some edge somewhere, uh, and you know they've been tuned for 20 years, uh, so it's it's really good and performant. Uh, RASP is extremely language and framework specific. So you go and you're like, well, I need a RASP now because NIST tells me I do, but I can only find a RASP that's good for Java and .NET. What am I going to do for my PHP and my, my Python Go and whatever else? Well, WAF is language agnostic for the most part. So now you can still use your WAF and a RASP where it makes sense, where, where you can support those specific languages. Uh, RASP weakness, it's not environment aware, right? Uh, whereas a WAF is more environment aware. What I mean by that is there may be environmental controls that are outside of the application. 
that a WAF may be aware of, where a RAF, since it lives in the app, isn't, right? So you've got strengths and weaknesses on both, and I, I think there, there's a really good marriage here. Um, you know, so I want to talk about the gap. So I talked about how uh, a RASP can provide the gap coverage. So if you look at the uh, Equifax issue, right, um, there was a disclosed CVE about Apache uh, stress vulnerability um, that was fixed, uh, but, you know, there weren't any patches. You know, there weren't patches for WAFs. We didn't see much come out there. Um, you know, there were no updates, but attacks were starting to be detected like almost immediately within a day when that was released. You know, Equifax then, uh, the breach occurred, you know, and, 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 and you know the timeline for, for, for the most part because it was something that was talked about for months and still is, right? But with a, a WAF, I've got to wait to get a patch or understand what that bypass was uh, in the back end. It's probably something because it was a, a serialization issue uh, that wasn't protected from your WAF anyway. But if you had a, a RASP running, you would have already been protected, right? So it's gonna cover you from a gap perspective for that gap in time where you need to patch your WAF. And, and I'll finish up with the way I look at it, take a step back is if I'm driving my car now, would I rather have a seatbelt, a WAF, an airbag, a RASP, or both? And that's it. Questions? Thank you, Dave. Yeah, let's, uh, well, <clears throat> the, uh, our team will monitor the uh, chat here and see if anyone has questions. I um, actually did have one though before other people jumped in on here. Um, yeah, my question, you know, to you would have been, hey, I, I know that um, RAFs, you have to sacrifice time there, right? You have to sacrifice um, some of your application resources there. Now, I guess the question then becomes, are there alternatives should people focus more on WAF? Because when it comes to, you know, application uh, resources, that matters a lot to business, right? Business want to make sure that there's no downtime or lag time. Yep. So, yeah, so I guess my question really is, you know, how do you weight that? So that's a really good question, Adele. And, and I think every organization is going to have to weigh that on their own. I mean, there are some applications that are inherently not performant. Um, and you and you add a RASP in them, and they're going to be even worse, right? Um, but I think you know, from a RASP perspective, it's really easy to—I don't want to say tune because it's a terrible word—but turn off rules that don't matter, right? If you're using uh, a NoSQL backend, why would you turn on the SQL injection rule, right? So th there are definitely things you can do with a RASP, but still be protected with the things that are really important to you, and have that that overall layered approach to your security profile and, and program uh, and still get the performance that you, that you need and require, right? Mm -hmm. There, you may, you may only like, you may be really comfortable with your WAF for mm -hmm. cross-site scripting and for, you know, even SQL injection, whatever it might be, but you might be like, Oh, well, the things that are causing all the problems in the news and being exploited are untrusted deserialization issues. So maybe that's the only one I turn on for the RASP, mm -hmm. but it's, it's so important because if that's exploited, you right. know, you're the next Equifax, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things, it's a balance because mm -hmm. there definitely is an impact and, right. and I wouldn't sit here and say there's not. <laughs> right, that's fair. Okay, so it looks like we do have a couple of questions that came in. Um, someone was asking if RASP is open source slash, if not, how much will it cost? Um, uh, I'm actually, sorry, go ahead. So, yeah, I was gonna say, I can answer it. There, there is a RASP that is open source. Oh. Uh, it's decent. I can't remember the name of it. I wish I could. What I can do is I can go back and get the link and I'll, I'll send it over your way, Adele. <laughs> That'll um, be great, yeah. Um, it is from a group in China. Not sure how people feel about that, uh, but it, there is a RASP open source. But again, it's very language specific. So it's not like you're going to be able to go out there and be like, oh, it's going to cover all of my applications. Right. It's probably just for one specific language or framework version, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually think that leads into the uh, second question. Um, 
Matt C was asking, is a RAS dedicated application or is it a method of software design? Um, it is an agent. So if you're, com if you're, com um, if you use something like uh, New Relic in, in for performance monitoring in your applications, it's exactly like that. So I'll just give you an example. So our Java RASP agent is just a jar file that you add to a command line property called the Java agent when you're starting up your JVM. So your Tom Kag or what's for your web logic uh, and that's it. Uh, so you don't do any coding or anything in your app. It's not technically a separate application. It's something that is loaded in the JVM as a property and it instruments all of the code that's running in that JVM. We have a question from Dean Henry. He's asking, in your experience, what percentage of contrast clients run both WAF and RASP? All of them. Okay. To some extent. I mean, yeah. and, and a lot of that has been because it, the RASP is so language specific. And, you know, you look at some of the larger organizations and they have almost every language under the sun. Yep. So they still have to have that, but that's allowed them to get to the point where they can configure it to the, you know, where they're comfortable with the performance hits. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, my question is we have generalized cheat sheet for SQL injection. Will RAS identify all of them listed on it? Yep. All right. I mean, a good RASP should, yes. <laughs> uh, so yeah. we, we've, we've done uh, some extensive um, payload list testing. Uh, I actually wrote a blog about it a while back mm -hmm. uh, with all of the common payload, like payloads, all the things, and a lot of the common, because, you know, we're, we're continually looked at uh, against a, a WAF as well, and a lot of organizations just pull down payload lists. Um, so, yeah, we, we're, we're, we're always testing against those. Uh, what's interesting about payload lists is if you're using them, even to test against your WAFs, is we found that a lot of the lists aren't curated very well, and there's a lot of them that uh, contain stuff that really aren't attacks mm -hmm. um, or stuff that are just used to kind of probe the system mm -hmm. to, to see how it responds, but it's not actually going to exploit anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just, or, or there's duplicates. There's so many duplicates <laughs> yeah. within those payloads. So. Yeah, okay. Uh, what are some examples of products companies that are WAF versus RASP? I feel like those two things are interchangeable a lot. Yeah, um, it's hard to ask a, a RASP vendor that question. <laughs> uh, you know, there, there is, you know, for the most part, your cloud providers, your Amazons, your uh, Microsofts, your Googles, they all have their flavor of the WAF. Uh -huh. uh, OWASP actually has a mod security module um, that is really good and performant from a WAF perspective. Uh -huh. um, from a RASP perspective, there's not very many RASP vendors. Um, you know, there's uh, Imperva uh, and Signal Sciences, but they've kind of moved away from traditional RASP and are doing more WAF type work now. Uh -huh. um, just because it's, you know, I don't want to say it's easier, but you know, it, it covers more, more things and in, in more languages. Mm -hmm. So there's not, there's not a lot of organizations that are just strictly doing what I would consider RASP, which is all in the application. Cool. Um, let's see here. So we have Scott Hunter contrast. So contrast for everyone out there, contrast has a community edition, um, which allow you to basically test the product. Um, I believe it's one license. If I'm, uh, I think I checked it out once. And uh, Contrast will give you one license to, you know, test on any one application you may have. Yep. Um, let's see here. Oh, I think someone found the open source RASP, and it was, uh, it's called Open RASP by yep. Baidu. That is the one. Yep. Wow, four thousand commits. These guys have been busy. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, I, it, it, from what we have seen, it's decent. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, if it's something that fits in your organization, I you know, definitely try it out. Why not? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, let's see here. At what point of the LCS, SDLC should RAS be inserted in the application? 
Uh, so that's a great question uh, and why I love saying extend right. This should be running in your production environment. Uh, it should be running in your production app, which is why performance is, is a big deal to some, uh, but it is actually doing the job of making sure that attempted uh, exploits of exploitable paths uh, are blocked and stopped. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Someone is asking, you said WAF is primarily scripts and SQL. RAS is for what exactly? So a WAF is not necessarily primarily scripts and, and, and SQL. It's, it's run, it, this, this is the way I kind of look at the two. Uh, so uh, another, another uh, way to look at it is a WAF is kind of like your virus scanning, right? It's like that initial line of defense of your your, your laptops or your, your desktops, or it's looking for certain signatures, you know, it's scanning through the files. That's what WAF is gonna do. It's gonna scan through those requests. It's got a bunch of regular expressions that it's gonna run against and say, hey, that looks like cross-site scripting, or that looks like command injection, or that looks like SQL injection, and it's just gonna stop it there. Whereas a RASP, it takes it many steps further than that. You know, it initially looks at it and says, oh, that may look like cross-site scripting, or that may look like SQL injection, but now it's gonna take it further all the way to that backend where it actually makes the call to SQL and look at it and make sure, hey, this was untrusted data coming in. It looks like it's a SQL injection attack and it's being executed in a SQL injection sync. So I'm gonna block it. So there's so much more context versus the RAF, the WAF, it's just saying, oh, it looks like it, so I'm gonna stop it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see here. So we have someone who said, does Contrast offer a free demo if an organization would like to, I guess, ch check it out? Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm sure you can get them Scott Hunter's uh, info. I'm sure yeah, <laughs> I, I, dropped, <laughs> I dropped Scott's email on uh, with them. Uh, let's see here, uh, any, any common mistakes from clients slash organization as they're considering or even implementing a RASP? Um, Common mistakes, expecting it to be the same application that it was before you added the RASP. I performance. Mean, I, you know, performance is definitely, I mean, there are some, uh, and don't get me, there are some that they don't see a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if you have um, applications that are sending massive amounts of data back and forth, like for instance, we have some customers that they send massive JSON payloads in their requests. You know, in some cases, they'll um, base 64 encode an image, right, mm -hmm. in JSON, mm -hmm. uh, and it slows it down tremendously because you think it's parsing and, and looking at all that data. So I think a lot of it is understanding that there, there will be a performance impact. Mm -hmm. uh, it, could be, it could be zero, it could be 10%. I mean, it's just, it's usually somewhere in that range. Yeah, and it sounds like uh, you know the architecture of the application itself factors in a lot in that process, right? Uh, much like what you said, if they're taking a basic of an image and taking a JSON of that, yeah, of course that's going to take. Yeah, and yeah, and, and I think a close second is if 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 you're asked what language and framework you support, tell them the exact versions, because because if you say uh, we have Java and Struts. Mm -hmm the RASP vendor may support Java and struts, but it may not be the versions that you're running in your tech stack. Mm -hmm. Right, right. right. Uh, okay, I think we have a good one here. Could you clarify the RASP's agent quality? You mentioned an example where you launch it with Java. Is that the same method that would work with other languages, which makes it so languages specific? Would you compile it into a C application at build time? Um, some of them are compiled uh, like that today, um, even the Java agent is, but it's, it's loaded. They're all loaded differently. Mm -hmm. Like uh, for Node, it's an NPM module, right? For, for Ruby, it's a Ruby gem. Uh, you know, for Java, it's a, it's a Java agent jar. Uh, for .NET, I think there's a couple of different ways that they do it. Um, I even think there are, you know, we have some customers that for Java, uh, we have an RPM module for install onto the, the host system. Uh, so there's definitely different ways and different, you know, compiled compilation methods uh, that we've used for customers, but most of them use their standard approach uh, that that's common for that language. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, two more questions here. So from Shay, should organization with little resources uh, devote time to security? Devote to security, just use WAF backed up with security and dev principles or is it essential or critical to run both? It's, it's tough, right? Uh, yeah. I, I, I think we're all strapped for money. We're all strapped for resources. Right. I, I think based on the data, based on understanding that all of our applications are vulnerable right. and the approach of a layered security approach, running both is the right answer. Uh, but I understand that that's not always going to, to be the case or have the financial means to do so. Uh -huh. But the, the great thing is, is there are open source options for either or, right? You know, the, the Baidu option may or may not work, but from a open source standpoint, mod security is probably good enough for your WAF and that's quote unquote free, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, when running security scans by SOC on your enterprise, are we likely to have a lot more false positive as a result of RASP? No, I mean, the great thing is, is you know, you shouldn't have more false positives because of RASP. RASP should only be uh, as accurate, you know, as possible and let you know when something is actually going to be exploited or that it's blocked it because it would have been exploited, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Uh, you're going to see a lot of fault. Like if you ran a scan, if you ran like a, um, you know, expose a, or, you know, some, some rapid seven or something scan against mm -hmm. an application with a WAF running, there's going to be a ton of alerts and a ton of false positives um, coming out of that, but the RAF shouldn't, shouldn't result in an alert, heavier alert fatigue way. Um, and it should just let you know of the actual issues or the actual potential exploits that it's seen. Okay. And last but not least, what are false positive chances with RASP? And since RASP stops code from running, can we run into a self imposed DOS? Those are extremely good questions. Um, so there are definitely going to be false positives with RASP. Uh, I don't want to sit here and say that there's going to be zero. Uh, you know, we, we run a bug bounty on our Java agent um, with bug crowd. It's a private um, bug bounty where, you know, we feel like we get pretty darn good coverage from the researchers that are testing. The false positive rate is somewhere around uh, one to two percent of all the attacks that we're blocking that are actually valid ones. Um, which is which is pretty good um, in my eyes, but uh, you know it's it's nowhere near what a WAF would be. You know you're going to get a whole lot more false positives and alerts that way. Um, you know as far as self DOS, so it's interesting, right? So th this is this is a predicament that RASP has as well. Is if it get if the application or the agent gets into a state where it's not sure what to do by design, it has to fail open. And as a security person, that's hard to hear. Um, but we can't just assume that it's an attack, you know, because that could create that self DOS, right? So we have to fail open and that, you know, that makes me swallow hard, but that's, you know, that's by design um, because we, we could and would run into issues where there was a self DOS. Yeah. All right, that was the uh, last question on here. Um, David, thank you so much. And thank you, Scott, for putting this thing together. Really appreciate um, Contrast stepping forward and helping us uh, launch off this webinar. And thank you everyone who joined, um, who joined this event. If you want to learn more about CSNP, again, go to csnp.org. And I will make my presentation publicly available and we'll reach out to David as well um, and obtain his uh, presentation and share with uh, everyone who's able to attend tonight's event. Uh, thank you everyone, have a good night.